Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. I've got a special guest today, Dr. Eric Wan, W-O-N. I realized that I misspelled it in some of our paperwork. You are a former flight surgeon, which you're going to talk to us about that, but you also are behind Wave Neuroscience and the Brain Treatment Center. So you guys specialize in uh, fixing broken brains, right? Yeah, yeah, we could. Uh, you could describe it that way. We're we're really uh, treating. Um, our technology was innovated to optimize brain function, but we found some of the things that we do best are treat concussions and uh, post traumatic stress. And so, uh, with my background in the military, it was something that really resonated with me and something that I wanted to get involved in. So, so we'll go we'll go forward a little bit before we go back. So somebody would call. Uh, brain treatment center, like it could be a football player, could be a vet, could be somebody that sustained some type of, of head trauma, but is it just from traumatic type injuries that somebody would seek out your, your practice? No, you know, we found that there's many types of brain injuries that can occur. And so I think classically, we typically think of traumatic brain injury being a mechanical injury, whether it's a head-on-head linebacker versus lineman type injury or a blast injury uh, in combat or uh, somebody falling off a ladder and hitting their head. Uh, But what we found is there can be neuronal injury from many other uh, types of environmental factors or influences. And just the emotional trauma of losing a loved one, whether it's uh, a child to cancer or a buddy um, you know, in the military, uh, that can certainly cause uh, some changes in brain function. Um, chemical trauma, whether it's through years of hard drinking or drugs, um, these are all things that we're starting to observe uh, changes in brain function. And those are the types of um, uh, pieces that we can both image and treat uh, over time. When you say image, you mean literally take scans of the brain and view what's happening? Yeah. And, and so that's part of, uh, it's the first step in, in our protocol. And uh, we're using something called quantitative EEG. Uh, it's an electrophysiologic picture of the brain, much like an EKG is an electrophysiologic picture of the heart. And what we're looking for is really how the brain is communicating. The different areas of the brain are communicating with each other, something we call alpha coherence. Um, and all of us have a, a fairly unique signature. And just to walk you down that path a little bit, um, we all encode information at a certain refresh rate, uh, for lack of a better term. And it's usually somewhere between 8 and 13 hertz, which means we're encoding information 8 to 13 times per second. But whether it's through the physical trauma of a blast injury or the emotional trauma of um, losing a loved one or uh, the chemical trauma that we talked about, we'll find clusters of neurons that fall out of synchrony with that dominant wavelength. And so in the scenario, the stereotypical waveform pattern for depression might be um, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, kind of the left forehead area. Uh, You may see a group that's firing, let's just say two hertz. And if the rest of your brain is firing 11.5 times per second, that information mismatch may cause somebody to experience a, a group of symptoms. In this case, if it's depression, they may feel lethargic. They may not wanna get out of bed. They lack motivation. And in a different scenario, let's say um, the back of the brain, the right occipital parietal lobe, which is your visual cortex. If you are cycling too fast and you're scanning your environment 30 times per second, but the rest of your brain can only process it at 11.5 times per second, there's an information overload that may cause you to experience anxiety. And what we've learned over time, and we're still getting better at this, but um, the geographic location of the injury and the frequency mismatch tell us a lot about how the individual may be experiencing the world. Mm. And part of that that I, I think is powerful is uh, we're no longer having to apply a label to somebody. When somebody comes in, uh, we don't have to say, you've got depression or anxiety or PTSD or, or whatever it is. We can just point to them. There's this cluster of neurons here that's undermining you. And if we nudge those in the right direction, your symptoms may improve. And in that's fact, cool. over time, yeah. Yeah, and so that's, I think, part of what I would view as is, is the breakthrough is 
so much of how we've practiced medicine in the past has been based on best evidence that we have, but uh, you don't have to go into uh, somebody's office and talk about your childhood or relive the trauma. Uh, we can just get this 15 minute scan uh, and let people know, well, this is what we're seeing. And if you're open to uh, this treatment, we might be able to um, help those neurons fall back into coherence or the synchrony uh, with the rest of the brain that we're striving to see. Science is cool. So <laughs> the old, uh, I saw some bad stuff in my life or had this bad thing happen to me. Okay, kid, get over it, move on, uh, or pull yourself up and be tougher. This is literally attaching uh, and quantifying not just damage, but uh, uh, physical condition that you can register and read and measure with scientific instrumentation. Yeah. Uh, that, that's not just typical. a feeling. We're not just talking about, like, I feel bad. Well, you feel bad because this thing in your head's not working right. That's exactly right. And, and to be clear, I don't know that anyone really has sort of the perfect brain and processing those kind of emotions when there is a traumatic event. That, that's really part of the human experience. And it's not something, uh, I don't know that any of us really escapes without experiencing any kind of um, adversity or trauma. And uh, we all manage it a little bit differently. Some people hide mm -hmm. it better than others. Um, and some people are able to just press on and they've, you know, they've got the grit and resilience to, to just keep pressing forward. Um, and there is an element of neuroplasticity where even if you did sustain an injury, many people, um, they just shrug it off and they keep pressing forward. That tends to be more of, uh, you're born with that. There's a genetic component to it, but for individuals who, you know, may struggle, uh, in these ways, um, we're now developing tools. And I think we're just on the front end of the innovation, but we're now developing tools that may be able to help, um, that type of, uh, cortical issue. Uh, come back. What was, what was the word you used? Uh, cortical injury. And describe uh, that for not just the listeners, but me. Yeah. So, so the brain, we talk about the cerebral cortex. And so okay. there's, there's, you know, your neurons uh, are, are kind of in, you know, they're, they're all over the brain, but the areas that we can reach fairly comfortably without any kind of surgery um, are on the cortex or on the outer layer uh, okay. of the brain. And just to touch on that, you know, I, I mentioned this imaging technology we have, the EEG. We're running that through a normative database that's age and gender matched for you. And then we're using an FDA approved technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, and the whole process is, we're calling it MyWave TMS. It's just a personalized precision guided methodology. This is all your stuff. Yeah. This isn't like something you downloaded off the internet onto your smartphone. This is all stuff you... That was Correct. A joke, Jack. That was a joke. <laughs> well, I think there may be a day and an age where we're always striving to make things uh, smaller, better, faster. And, uh, you know, maybe um, years from now, we may be able to do this from the comfort of someone's home. But right now, uh, you have to go to a clinic to, to get this done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the transcranial magnetic stimulation device, it's a 1.5 to 2 Tesla MRI grade coil. Uh, but rather than create a image, uh, it's delivering pulses uh, to the brain and trying to uh, activate the neurons in a way where they start firing again at their optimal rate. And so it, it's painless. You just sit in a chair for 30 minutes and for six seconds out of the, those 60 seconds per minute, um, it's providing stimulation to remind the brain to fire at, it, just in a hypothetical scenario, 11.5 times per second. And if you give the body that reminder, many times it's doing the heavy lifting for you. It's not you know, 30 minutes a day isn't going to get you where you need to go uh, super rapidly. We typically see about three to four weeks of time where we ask people to come in every day. But even if people, let's just say somebody has to go away for a month and they get two weeks of treatment, when they come back, many times we see uh, progress uh, in the way that those neurons are firing. And I think this is true to uh, just our natural biology and how nature engineered us. We, we tend to be healing organisms. And you think about, you get a broken bone, and if the doctor puts the two ends of that bone together, uh, it's going to grow back, it's going to heal, it's going to grow back stronger. And if you put two ends of a wound margin together, that'll heal, and, and you may have a little bit of a scar, but um, you patch up quite nicely. And many times the brain's the same way, it just gets stuck at a frequency that 
uh, is causing you to feel a certain cluster of symptoms and it needs a gentle nudge in the right direction. And, and that's really what we specialize in is finding those areas, uh, using some precision guided um, testing and then stimulating just the areas that need it um, in, in a fairly gentle uh, and safe manner. You talked about mechanical injuries. So most of us, when we think of trauma to the brain, we think of a baseball bat or a curb or a steering wheel or football helmets, uh, emotional trauma or, or uh, abuse, um, not, not from blunt trauma, but how is that? How is a scary or um, uh, exciting or, or fear-filled event, how is that causing this? Do we know? And so I, I think from a root cause perspective, we don't know, we don't know the exact answers yet. Um, I do know, even with what we can visualize now, many times the emotional pain that people experience can, can manifest, at least in these images, more significantly than, than even physical pain. And so it's, it's a real phenomenon that's, that occurs. But we're also getting smarter about um, how the brain responds to different types of trauma. And many times we don't think of um, blast injuries as being kind of the same as uh, a head-on collision or, or those types of traumas. But in, in fact, the science around that kind of overpressurization injury, we're getting uh, much better and more sophisticated at um, determining how those injuries occur and the types of impact they may have on the brain. Mm. And uh, there's some great researchers out of uh, Uniformed Services University and the Department of Defense where we're now measuring at low levels. Um, I mean, the, the obvious one is with significant blasts, uh, whether it's through IEDs or breaching or artillery, um, you know, the, the shock wave that occurs with those types of detonations, uh, anything more than four or five PSI, there's a risk of some type of injury. But even low level injury or low level um, blast, we're starting to study the cumulative effect of those. And, and I think that's going to be interesting. We don't have all the answers yet, but it's an area I think of uh, very intense research that we're starting to get uh, uh, better answers to. So when you're coming up with this technology was I'm just kind of thinking about it like you look at my brain I tell you how I feel and you can kind of correlate what you see through the test imaging with my symptoms or my feelings is that how you started to develop the, the database of how to be able to say like okay this is causing this because how do you not know that this chunk of my brain should be going at five hertz instead of 11.5 yeah, and so the technology was initially innovated not for a specific diagnosis. I would say it's, it's pretty agnostic to uh, the diagnosis. It, it was really engineered to uh, optimize brain function kind of as a whole organ to make it a more efficient uh, engine. And many times we don't think of it that way, but um, you know, your brain is roughly 2% of your body mass, but 20% of your caloric burn is, is a very thirsty organ because it's, it's just burning a lot of a lot of energy and the more efficient that engine is um, the better you're probably functioning and uh, the clearer uh, your thought process processes may be and so this was initially innovated by a group of physicians uh, electrical engineers and physicists and, and so that part of it was uh, initially just striving to how do we get um, this organ to function better but what we learned over time, and there's been a bit of an evolution. Uh, when I first came in, you know, we had these observations that it was helping people uh, with concussions and, and with post-traumatic stress, and there's a lot of overlap between those two populations. Um, regain a bit of their function, and that would manifest in many different ways. A lot of it is just um, having a bit more emotional resilience, but a fairly common observation was people were sleeping better, uh, getting not necessarily more quantity of sleep, but better quality sleep, more restorative sleep. Hmm. And that has so many downrange benefits. Um, and, and I think we're starting to learn better uh, what that manifests like. And so we're, we're embarking on some new studies uh, with other um, tier one universities um, and, and trying to understand uh, how does it impart those kinds of changes. Uh, but to answer your question, it, it wasn't set up initially to specifically 
treats uh, concussion, traumatic brain injury. It just happened to be a population uh, where we're seeing some really good response. Okay. And then uh, the other part that we've learned over time was uh, people started asking the question, you know, if I'm feeling this much better, uh, what could this do for people who are already um, functioning pretty well, uh, like elite athletes and uh, tier one operators? Could we, uh, the term that was coined by uh, a general was, could we prehabilitate uh, some of these folks? And we have seen some performance gains, uh, but we're just starting to really embark on that arena. You know, we initially started out as um, kind of a medical output, saving life, stamping out disease. That's sort of our, our charter and our calling. Um, but the, the market's really spoken to us and we realized that um, if we can help people to just perform better in their daily lives, um, most people are very open to that. And, and I think that's disarming in a certain way. There are many people who um, may be feeling their functional level or their performance diminish over time and uh, they aren't necessarily feeling um, so bad that they would go to a doctor or seek help. Um, but if this is something uh, that can just help people to perform a little bit better, give them a little bit more of an edge, um, there's a lot more openness, uh, I think, to uh, getting that help. And, you know, from our perspective, again, you know, it's not the label that really matters to us. It's more about, you know, can we help people um, mm -hmm. live a better quality of life and, um, you know, begin, in, in many cases, the healing journey towards becoming a better person. What are you seeing with addiction? Um, is that something that's got its own map, uh, its own signature? It does. It does. And so we typically see what's called uh, a six hertz spike. And so we see a lot of neuronal activity in a certain area. And it depends on the substance. Stimulants and depressants behave a little bit differently. So methamphetamine versus uh, an alcohol addiction would look a little bit differently on these images. Um, but we have so just, seen... to, just to ask, though, like if you had like a room full of addicts and you scanned them all, would you be able to look at the paperwork and say that what, that guy's an opioid, this guy's a cocaine guy, that guy's an alcohol guy? Like, is it that specific, your, your um, data gathering? Have you been able to correlate and attach? No, I want to say we're, we're that specific yet. Like, I don't think we, we have the capability of naming the substance. Um, It'd be a lot cooler if you did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that might be broken we can um, Except but, that like, put that on the schedule for next week. Got it. Got it. But, um, but what we can do is we can, we can identify that there's a predisposition uh, towards addiction. And we can have sort of these honest conversations that we're seeing a signal in the EEG. Not everyone necessarily is going to be uh, a substance abuser, but we can, we can see on the imaging that somebody is, is predisposed to that. And, and so that's really where the conversation starts. And um, it, it's not something that uh, I think our clinics or physicians um, are looking to do it's not like hey you know we see this shame on you it's, it's nothing like that. i meant more from a pa patient standpoint like i'm here i'm depressed i'm drinking too much or i'm here i'm depressed i'm on these pills that the doc gave me and i can't get off of them or i got a blast injury and now the opioids that i was prescribed for pain i'm eating all day long because it's been years of taking yeah, i guess yeah. maybe that was more the course i was taking not that you were trying to bust somebody <laughs> Yeah, and this was, it's interesting that you, you, you bring that up because uh, we ran an initial pilot of veterans out of San Diego and one of the incidental findings we weren't expecting is a lot of people are coming back saying they don't feel the need to reach for their pills anymore or to, to go and pound, you know, a six pack of beer. And so we started exploring that a little bit and um, we, we've actually done some trials now. Uh, we're about to embark on one with uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and we ran a small pilot with um, a private insurer. And what we found is that um, people are able to slowly wean off of many of their medications and don't feel that same compulsion uh, that they do with the treatment and or without the treatment. And my observation, and this is non scientific, it's just my observation. Um, but Isn't many, that what science is, though, Doc, of observing and forming yeah. a hypothesis and all that? Absolutely. Yeah. And so this, sounds smart. That, I'm just. <laughs> no, 
No, but it, that that is how much of science is born. It, it's just making these observations, but we haven't taken the extra step of wrapping around it really robust uh, data. Um, but um, you know, many of the veterans I've seen go through this, and many of them are some of my closest friends. A lot of the habits that they develop, whether it's reaching for a bottle or a medication, um, it's an intelligent response to their environment. If they're having panic attacks when they go into a crowded room, but their wife wants to go to the party, um, they might drink a little bit before they go there just so they can calm their nerves and, and be in the moment and, and not have a panic attack. Or whether they're um, you know, smoking a little bit of weed to get through. Uh, I don't, uh, my view on this has changed a little bit over time. And I don't view that necessarily as a lack of fortitude or willpower or discipline. Um, these have uh, very uh, notable effects on the EEG, and it may be pushing the neurons in the right direction where they can function better in the environment. And so, uh, so they're adapting. They're adapting to to their environment. And what's been interesting is if you correct that emotion, like if you're able to uh, push them in the right direction and their anxiety dissipates, they naturally, without any uh, coaching or pushing from the doctor or the talk therapist, many of them just stop uh, taking their medication or drinking as much as they do. They can still drink socially, but they don't lose control. And so that was uh, almost an accidental finding in our first study. We just had a lot of people, a lot of the subjects in the trial telling us, hey, I feel um, less beholden to my opioids or my benzodiazepines or alcohol. And so we have started uh, trying to be a bit more scientific about that and study it. Uh, That's very so, cool. Yeah. So Let's, we're, go ahead. We're starting to learn more about that. And, and just to give one last data point, we know from uh, inpatient rehabilitation centers that are detoxing people, uh, roughly 70 to 85% of patients who go through that will relapse. will be that level of recidivism in the first year. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that that is a lack of determination to succeed. You know, I think that there is organic brain injury in a lot of this population that with correction, we could increase the chances for them uh, to remain sober over a longer period of time. And so we're starting to partner with best in class centers um, to see, you know, how successful will this be? And the early returns are positive, but there's still a lot more research and science to be done. It's very, very uh, interesting stuff. So you're basically massaging the brain with some electricity is what I'm gathering. It's kind of making it, that's what I'm hearing yeah. here. Yeah. It's like, the, it's like the little pads I put on my elbow that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty close analogy. And some veterans have even called it their brain massage. Um, but just to kind of describe it, it's not... I think that there is some misperception. There, there is something called electroconvulsive therapy, where it's very high wattage energy being delivered to the brain. And that's not what this is. Um, part of the reason we're using an MRI grade coil, the first order principles of physics that allow us to achieve the results we want is uh, magnetic coils can deliver energy across a solid barrier. And so we have this one centimeter piece of skull that stands between our, our external environment and our brain. And this coil can uniquely deliver action potentials to, to brain tissue, whereas other types of stimulation wouldn't be able to achieve that end. Um, you can do it with direct current. If you place you know, the pads on your forehead and you deliver very high wattage, you can traverse the skull. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a pleasant experience, and you usually have to be under anesthesia to do that. And so this is does, the, does the patient feel this when it's happening? When you're sitting in your office and you're getting treatments, do you, is there a sensation, a feeling? Do, you, do your eyes roll back in your head? Do you wet yourself? <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's very mild. And right down on the stick. No, yeah, you, you, won't need, uh, you won't need anything like that. It's, you, you sit in a chair, uh, there's a te technician that places the coil in the, in the right location, and it's about six seconds of stimulation, 54 seconds of rest, and you go through 30 cycles of this. And it's been described to me as uh, a hummingbird tapping your forehead. Um, it's a mild sensation. You, you barely notice it. Um, the first time you go through it, it's very novel and uh, you're maybe a little bit nervous. But after you go through a few cycles of this, you realize, no, this, isn't, this really isn't that bad. And then uh, even our children, many of our children who come in, 
um, they enjoy it and, and they're feeling quite a bit better afterwards. And so they'll work with the technician, try to hold the coil to their head. Um, so it's, it's, I can't say a hundred percent it's painless. Um, there are risks and side effects that we are very honest and transparent about. Uh, the most common being people can have uh, a mild headache afterwards, usually alleviated by over-the-counter ibuprofen or Tylenol. Uh, What's causing the headache? Do you know? It, it's, we believe it's energy. When, when it passes through your skull, there's, there's a layer of muscle tissue that's cut. There's an involuntary spasm that occurs, and it's just fatigue of the muscle that's causing so the So you're headache. basically like got a cramp in the, that little layer of muscle. Yes. And, that and, never gets worked. That's correct. And generally that tends to subside after the first few treatments. Um, but there is a subset, uh, something less than 5% who uh, will have headaches. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's not uh, a horrible, intractable, uh, terrible migraine type headache or anything like that. But um, it is a known side effect of the treatment. Um, so we generally talk about that. There can be a feeling of euphoria after the treatments or, or overstimulation. Um, and then the most significant side effect we talk about, uh, there is a hypothetical risk of seizure and the number to discuss there, it's generally, uh, one in 10,000 to one in 500,000 are the numbers that are talked about. Um, so you say hypothetical, have you not seen a patient? Knock on wood, we haven't, we haven't had one. We haven't had a de novo seizure at our clinic. Um, and we're, we do sub threshold treatment, meaning, um, uh, we calculate the amount of energy that's required to evoke an action potential or a motor threshold, which means there's a twitch in your thumb. And then we lower the energy level to 60 to 80% of that. There are other groups where we're doing super threshold where they're cranking the energy up um, and they have a higher risk of headaches and seizure. The reason we're able to lower the energy is uh, we believe the focus should be on precision guidance and trying to deliver the minimal dose to achieve the effect that you want. Um, in this case, more isn't necessarily better. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and again, I'm going to knock on what we haven't had any of those serious adverse events using this methodology. Um, but if it puts kind of a safety benchmark around that number, uh, the Nintendo Game Boys our kids play with, uh, they list a risk of seizure in the brochures of one in 4,000. And so it, it's a safe number, but it's something we have to be very honest and transparent about. From the Nintendo? Yeah. The one flickering in 4,000? Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. My kids are a little older, so there's no Nintendo's going on. <laughs> yeah. Let's go, let, late, but. let's go back a little bit. So you were in the Army. Talk about that path. What You joined the Army? So I was Navy. 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 I'm sorry. I thought I, heard, I thought I heard Army earlier. My apologies. So you joined the Navy. Yeah, but I, okay. I was Navy. Um, I, you know, I took a scholarship when I was in, in medical school. And... Um, uh, joined active duty around 1999, went to flight school. Um, the way the Navy kind of squeezes out more years out of its doctors is um, th that you do what's called a general medical officer tour where you're embedded inside of a unit. And so there's different types of GMOs in the Navy. There's um, undersea medicine, which you're either taking care of a sub-community or uh, you're part of sort of the Navy Special Warfare SEAL team. Uh, and there's aerospace medicine, uh, flight surgery, which is the path that I chose. And I was attached to a, a Marine Corps unit, HMM 268, uh, based out of Camp Pendleton. And um, I had the great privilege of then being selected for the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit. Um, we're a group where uh, we're floating in the Persian Gulf. And uh, our mission is, um, uh, if the call went out, uh, to be able to establish a beachhead and to be able to stand our ground for 30 days. Um, and so we were part of the aviation combat element, and uh, we were uh, an augmented uh, CH-46 squadron. We had CH-53s and then H-1s um, as light attack, and uh, uh, we helped to support the missions of the MU and uh, a couple of SEAL teams, and um, I had a great time with that. How long were you in? They give me credit for eight years. They give me the four years of medical school, but really four years of active duty. Okay. Um, yeah. And then you I got out. Go ahead. Yeah, I got out and uh, finished up my medical training. I went to Harvard to finish up my residency and fellowship, uh, and then came back out to California. And my wife and myself grew up in this area. So. Okay. Very cool. So you did four years, basically overseas. Yeah. Well. 
two of those were basically kind of training and work up with squadron. And then um, a year of that was essentially deployed and then wind down. Um, so, uh, um, so yeah, it was uh, um, a busy time, but uh, kept uh, a lot of those friendships. And um, I, I can say those are still uh, a lot of my closest friends. Wonderful. Did that have a big impact on what you're doing now, your time in service, the things you saw that you did? Oh, yeah. It's, it has everything to do with uh, uh, the path that I chose. And um, my squadron had the unfortunate distinction of having some of the first casualties of the second Gulf War. Um, uh, April 21st, uh, we were uh, part of a mission uh, out of Kuwait heading into Iraq. And... Um, it was low light night vision goggles of our helicopters. Uh, the pilots, we believe, were having, a, they had a vertigo episode because there was a, the horizon was obliterated by a sandstorm and they went nose down and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and perished. And um, as a byproduct of that, uh, a lot of my closest friends really struggled, whether it's through, you know, combat missions they were on later and, and had concussions or just the, the post traumatic stress of, uh, having some losing some of their brothers in combat um it's hard to serve and and really not uh carry that with you and so even as a doc as i left to go you know finish my training in the ivory tower um my heart was really with the guys and so um in any way that we can help whether it's you know there's this new technology i've heard about here or there's this great uh therapist in the community you know, we tried to find ways uh, to help um, some of the people who are struggling. And then when I heard about this technology, I think I had just become very jaded and skeptical. And um, I didn't believe it could do uh, kind of what I was hearing. Um, but I wanted to be open minded. And uh, I came and I listened and I spoke to the doctors and engineers and uh, it sounded promising. Um, and, and I talked to specialists in the area, you know, in this Southern California um some of the neurosurgeons at usc and uh, ucla and uh y'all believed that there there was promise uh but we needed to um do a bit more research and um academic rigorous scientific study and to the group's credit a, a lot of that study was embarked upon and uh, we saw some promising results but the clincher for me was uh sending in one of my one of my guys um one of the crew chiefs um, that I was very close friends with was struggling and uh, he agreed to go in. And uh, I'll tell you now, if, if he wasn't such a close friend, I may not have believed that the types of changes he experienced were possible. But really in two weeks, he went from uh, taking 20 medications a day to taking almost nothing but vitamins and uh, nutritional supplements. Um, his wife came into the clinic in tears saying, you gave me my husband back. This is the guy I married 10 years ago. Uh, and it was really quite moving to see this. That's and awesome. so, yeah, but, it, you know, you sort of default to your physician's scientific mode and you want to see, is this reproducible? Is it generalizable data? Will this work for other people who come in? And so I sent in a second Marine and a third Marine. And um, it, it, it was pretty consistent. Not everyone had the same... Uh, magnitude of effect as as that first marine, but uh, pretty transformative changes, and not typical of what we would see in medicine. We're used to kind of incremental change over a long period of time, but just in a matter of weeks, um, many of these guys and gals were telling me that they're they're thinking more clearly, um, they're sleeping better, they were able to read the pages in a book and remember what they were reading, um, and I just remember, and I woke up one day and. Uh, I was kind of like, my goodness, if, if this is what we think it is, this could really change and disrupt a lot of the way we're practicing medicine right now. And, and so um, as I had the conversations with the group, uh, there was a lot of discussion, you know, would you be willing to come on board? And for about a year and a half, um, I just declined uh, kindly because I was very happy where I was. Uh, and at that time, I was one of the chief physicians uh, at the Boeing company. And um, I took on a secondary role as, as the chief technology officer, which is how I interface with uh, this group. But um, uh, there was uh, an honest conversation I had with uh, 
a Navy SEAL Master Chief who kind of challenged me. He put his finger in my chest and said, what do you stand for, brother? You know, you're going to take care of snotty executives at Boeing the rest of your life, or are you going to jump in the trenches and uh, see how many people we can help with this? Because you realize that with this population, there's there's almost an infinite need. And I'm mm. very humbled that I didn't realize that the largest group of people with post-traumatic stress is not veterans, it's sexual assault survivors. And so there's yeah. so many vulnerable populations. Now we think about um, you know, COVID-19 first responders, paramedics, police officers, you know, firefighters. There's so many groups that are in harm's way that you could potentially help. And let me, so let me jump in and ask you a couple of questions real quick because you're blowing past some some stuff that's popping in my head. Do you see a better success rate with people that have let me, how many see if I can phrase this correctly? A child that's maybe abused physically or sexually as as a young person, and then you see them as a 30 or 40 year old and they've spent their whole life wired a certain way. That person versus a guy that was had a pretty good, healthy brain function, goes to war or whatever the tr trauma was, um, and has maybe got uh, trauma happened as an adult after a lot of the brain wiring happened in adolescence, because I know the brain's developing in young people into young adulthood, right? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I don't know if we have those answers um, in great detail yet. Um, my intuition is that um, the earlier we get people, the more that we can help because they're not sort of entrained in certain uh, behaviors. And, uh, you know, this kind of thing has a way of snowballing. And if you can get them before uh, they go down that slippery slope, we seem to be able to help those people better. But I would say the number one predictor is, is just people who are very motivated to get better. Um, and that sounds simple. Everyone wants to get better. Uh, in some sense, you would think intrinsically. Um, but not everyone really comes to, to our door really prepared um, to improve, so to speak. Um, it, it's hard to articulate, but uh, you know, people who are willing to not just get the treatment, but also focus on uh, getting proper nutrition, protecting their sleep. Um, uh, getting Having other a good, a good attitude to it, right? They're not, they, like you said, they want to get better. They've got a, they're attaching good emotion and, and positive energy to the treatment, right? That's exactly right. And versus, versus, well, we'll try this. Probably not going to work. Yeah. Well, not just that. I think even having family support, um, or, you know, if, if the spouse can come with them, um, you know, there's, there's so much that goes into, um, quality of life improvement, like this treatment in isolation, I think is an important foundational piece. Um, but you know, many times marriage counseling is, is a big part of this and we walk sort of side by side, uh, with those counselors. Um, Hey, do you think at all that this might have, and I don't, I'm not demeaning anything, but do you think maybe there's some placebo to this? I'm going to get this special awesome laser beam drilled through my brain and it's going to make me feel better as such like i mean is it not in some ways could it be like prayer for example where somebody is rewiring their own brain through thought energy i'm just tossing shit out there but it popped in my oh. head as we were talking it's very valid and i got one more thing to add to that because you like i just watched a documentary last night this dude's a shithead He's a drug addict. He starts breaking into homes. He ends up homeless. He ends up arrested. He goes to prison. He's a BMX rider. And um, in prison, he has this complete transformation. And it starts with him looking at the ceiling in the cell where somebody had written in pencil um, words we've all heard about how our thoughts become our actions and so on and so forth. And he sat and stared at this for days, the years that he was in prison. And he eventually kind of developed a new ethos and mindset and got out and made a really good life for himself, became an Olympic uh, coach. And now he's this motivational speaker, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no, you know, he, he had a bad upbringing, did all these terrible things. And this of course is an isolated instance, but you hear these stories, you know, or somebody that lost tons of weight that spent their 
whole life depressed, overeating, overindulging, and then they just decide, screw this, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then they start feeling happier and healthier. I'm just spitballing here. I don't want this all to be about your amazing product. I want to, I want to poke some holes in it so you have to argue. <laughs> Absolutely. No, yeah, it's it's a valid point. And the placebo effect is a very well studied phenomenon that occurs and specific to this whole area of science we call neuromodulation. Um, the placebo effect is um, very notable. It tends to be a larger uh, effect than you see with many drug trials. And so there is a certain amount of placebo effect in our pilot studies. We've seen separation from, from placebo. Um, so, you know, I can say with some confidence that this is a, a bit more than placebo, but in the event that it is, it's still a positive effect. And so, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I would say even for my buddies, even if it's placebo, gosh, if you're having, you know, a 40 to 50% improvement in your symptoms, you know, that's a great placebo. And, and so I, I would say go for it, but especially if there's very little risk of, or, or very little downside. Uh, but we've been encouraged, and, and all I can say is that it's promising at this point that uh, we're seeing the data separate from placebo. Uh, and so um, that part of it is what um, I, I think keeps us moving forward and um, kind of excited about uh, the progress that we're seeing. Can the patient, like I come in, you treat me, you get the misfiring section kind of back on track. Is there something that the patient can do uh, to negatively impact that and, and see a, uh, an issue develop again and, and they have to come back in? Or is there something, uh, is it completely out of their control? I know diet and sleep and things like that that you've talked about, but is there thought patterns? Is there things that cause that brain activity to, to uh, reverse? Yeah, I mean, of course, if you are endorsing unhealthy behaviors, whether it's uh, going out until three in the morning and, um, you, know, you know, going on all night benders and uh, continuing to do drugs or alcohol, uh, we're probably just spinning our wheels at that point and, and that's not going to be a successful patient. Um, so we do need a level of compliance uh, when, when people come in. Uh, but even beyond that, one of the things we really harp on and focus on is uh, people being very mindful of their sleep, trying to go to bed at the right time, getting blue light in the morning. And we haven't really talked about uh, blue light. That, that may be something that is underappreciated, um, but there, there were several Nobel Prizes awarded in 2017 for the discovery of circadian rhythm and blue light, something that we've known uh, for a while, but I, I think really elegantly designed uh, studies. And so, the first biological cue we have in the morning uh, to begin your circadian rhythm is, is getting natural sunlight. And when blue light enters your eye and hits your retina, uh, it suppresses the secretion of melatonin, which makes you stimulated and alert. And really exactly. And so 14 hours later, you're gonna have a spike in melatonin, uh, which will allow you to get very deep restorative sleep. And so part of our philosophy, just to honor our biology is, in the morning, get at least 30 minutes to an hour of natural sunlight outside, and that will set your circadian rhythm. And then in the evening, try not to get blue light. And there is a certain amount of blue light that's emitted from our tablets and phones and TVs. And even the content, if you're watching like a thriller or Game of Thrones or something, it's stimulating and it, it may keep you from uh, getting really restful sleep. But if you're showering yourself with, with blue light from these devices, uh, it may really undermine your sleep. And so uh, those are things that we, we try to coach our patients on. Um, but uh, something really almost all of your audience can do is uh, just in the morning, go out, get the natural sunlight. Um, and then in the evening time, uh, try to avoid uh, too much device time, but also at the first sign of nighttime somnolence, when you're getting sleepy and you're yawning, if you're having that melatonin spike, you've got about 30 minutes to get into bed and try to get sleep. And if you do that, you should, uh, get more REM sleep and stage three, stage four sleep. You're saying versus like fighting through it to finish a movie or finish some chores or exactly. whatever. Like yeah. once that, that starts, that getting sleepy, take advantage of it. Yeah. And I'm as guilty as anyone. You know, I, I'm pretty awful about wanting to, you know, send that last email or, 
um, you know, play a game with my kids or something. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, we have to do our best to really try to be disciplined about our sleep um, because it, it has such a significant impact uh, along so many different lines. I tell you, Doc, the last, uh, it's probably been about six years for me, I got really serious about that sleep. And I, from like not drinking too much liquids to make me wake up and have to go to the bathroom to uh, putting noise canceling headphones on and listening to like, you know, the sounds of the rain or, you know, something like that just to block out noises that would wake me up. And it's been great. And it's like you're saying, it's like, ah, I got to go to bed. I, I, I don't need to push the sunlight thing. We do that here. Go have, you know, tea or coffee on the porch or take the dog for a walk. I think our moms were right. More fresh air and go to bed early. Now we're, we're like, like you said, one more email. We're, we're too connected to work. That's, that's uh, like burning us out. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how uh, uh, the wisdom of past generations still holds true. Mm -hmm. um, and I fear, like, I, I look at my own kids and uh, they're not getting out enough. And I, I think that's something we need to get back to is um, just trying to avoid. We're, we're kind of becoming over-digitalized and uh, getting out and playing some ball or going for a bike ride. I, I think that's something um, we're starting to lose in, in this generation. I was looking at a study recently of, testosterone level in middle-aged men now versus in like the 1940s and 50s, some old tests, and it's staggering. And I think part of it's probably just physical exertion, how much you, you, you couldn't support your family just sitting at a desk all day. Only like a small sect of society had those types of jobs. Everybody else laid bricks and roads and dug holes and all that stuff. And now we're all just so relaxed and we're up all night. We're not sleeping, over-medicated. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I suspect it's all those things, a sanitary lifestyle, um, more sugary diets, um, poor sleep. Too much soy. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So like somebody listening, they say, geez, man, everything that this guy's talking about, resonates with me how do how do they find you do, they, do you just take new patients can somebody just call your office and set an appointment up do, how does that all work yeah so I, i'm part of the technology company called wave neuro and um, we have a clinical uh, branch um, it's a group of clinics there they're all physician owned called uh, brain treatment centers and uh, braintreatmentcenter.com lists all the locations um, that, that are using the technology um, and, uh, if they're curious about, uh, or wanting to go in a little more depth, they can go to waveneuro.com. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that the overarching message is, um, there's many other things people can be doing to improve, uh, their brain function and cognitive health, whether it's getting better sleep, uh, getting blue light in the morning. Um, I I've recently become a convert and, um, uh, the transcendental meditation, I think is a great adjunct for people to use, but, um, but certainly physical activity. It's crap, and, according to some, <laughs> why don't you yeah. go into that? I'll go into that a little bit. Cause you know, to some people, they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So there's, there's many different types of, of meditation. Transcendental meditation, uh, tends to be more kind of clearing of mind, focusing on breathing. And there's been very good, rigorous academic studies showing uh, that this helps people along a number of different dimensions, whether it's uh, protective against depression, uh, whether it's helping with focus, alert, alertness, and concentration. Um, and, and so this is something that we would recommend to just about anybody because it's easy. You can do it anywhere, whether it's in your car, whether it's in your bedroom, uh, even at work, if you just take five minutes to focus on your breathing and mindfulness. Uh, is something that can help. It's not for everyone. And, and so it's not something that, um, you know, it's, it's not kind of an all or nothing proposition, but it's it's essentially free and it just requires a little bit of education to get started on it, so. Have you ever heard of my friend, Brian McKenzie, The Art of Breath? He's done some work with the guys down at Stanford and uh, Cleveland Clinic. We've had him on the show a few times. He's actually coming to one of our big events in November to present. Do you know who he is? 
I know who he is by reputation. I've not met him or, or well, had a chance. To connect, connect you guys, because that's, you know, what you're talking about. It's kind of his thing. Absolutely. I'm, I'm taking notes on what you're saying. So you are saying sleep, blue light in the morning, transcendental meditation and breath work. Yeah. And then sort of um, activity and nutrition or, or two of the other, uh, I guess, uh, pillars um, of wellness and good health. The last one is a little bit uh, trickier and um, may sound a little bit hokey, but uh, connectedness, social connectedness uh, is something that I think is pretty important for people's wellness. And especially in this era now where uh, we're being asked to quarantine and to isolate. Um, I think that really works against us. We are by nature, I think, social and tribal creatures. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know in, in talking to a lot of my buddies, one of the things we miss the most when we list, when we leave service is that connectedness. It's sort of built into our work day, you know, with a squadron of 150 people, you know, just having built in time with their best friends uh, on a daily basis was such a luxury that we don't have uh, when we get out and uh, you're in a competitive workforce. And so whether it's just finding time to uh, really be connected with family, uh, whether it's spending the time to go to the range with, you know, your, your buddies, um, you know, finding a way to, to be connected, I think is uh, really important for our emotional well-being and overall health. I don't think that sounds hokey at all, Doc. The people that listen here, I think, are pretty uh, aware of that kind of stuff. I think that um, the, in some ways, like COVID's made that harder for some people. But then I see like on Facebook, people, our neighborhood, for example, is full of uh, families. And most of the time, there's a couple people that walk their dog. And since COVID, you see kids on bikes, uh, moms and dads with, you know, together because they can, because they're not tired from a two hour commute and, and, running in circles they're at home so i think in some ways maybe it goes both ways that people are are out doing some of those things yeah it it is an interesting phenomenon I, i've talked to a, a number of friends who have felt that way like this is the closest and most connected they've been to their family in years and so mm -hmm. if there's a silver lining to this um i think having that time with children and uh with family has been a, a really positive thing people are um, making more meals at home because a lot of places they can't go out and they're yep. home sitting around the table now if we could just get the internet to blow up for like a month <laughs> then we yeah that's yeah, a joke that, i know but that uh that may make uh everyone uh, a little bit happier because it's just uh everything's becoming uh so politicized and angry these days you know it's interesting like you're talking about the connectedness you know, like in a way, through social media and things of that nature, we are so connected. Like I can talk with my sister in Maine or my sister in Colorado and like talk like you and I talking like this. When we were kids, this was like maybe one day we can talk with a picture, right? Now it's we do it every day and we take it for granted. But like to be able to see the person's eyes crinkle when they smile and hear the sound of their voice. And that stuff I think is, that's real. And I think we are missing that through all of these types of interactions. No, I don't want to hug you and smell your hair, but <laughs> if you yeah. work with Marines, I can make these jokes to you. <laughs> well, it's, it is, I, I think it, it's been a very slow progression, but I just think when I was a kid, if, if I had a particularly, rough day and my parents yelled at me or you know my coach yelled at me whatever i would call my my best friend and we meet at the park and we talk and shoot some hoops or whatever and i think these days rather than that people would just text each other from the isolation of their room and they're not having that kind of human contact and yeah and you know, i wonder and we won't know i think for for a while but what kind of impact that has on people's psychology and socialization um and, I don't know, maybe I'm worried about nothing, but I think that we're losing something in that. I think you're spot on. I've spent most of my working career interacting with people from in one way, shape or form, as most people do, but I'm a people person. And I'm noticing, and I'm not, I'm not the older guy now saying that younger people are wrong because I don't like that either. Ah, you know, these young kids or these, you know what I'm saying? I don't have that attitude. 
but I do notice a lot of young people that I inter interact with on a professional level just email me. Well, I want to talk to you. It's not because I'm too lazy to type. Like I want to hear the sound of your voice. I also want to have a conversation that like we're doing now and maybe we'll come up with ideas that I wouldn't have thought about typing to you. And they're, they're just more comfortable not looking in my eyes, not talking to me, not they're like, well, I just want to sit here, sit my Red Bull and type. And I'm not insulting any age, but it's just that that does happen to be younger people. So if you're younger, I'm talking to you. But it's, but it's not, and it's not like their fault. That's just the way that things are for them. It's how their communication has been cultivated in that, that, that garden. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a weird cultural shift. I don't know. And, and sometimes I feel like, man, am I getting old becoming this crusty old curmudgeon that's saying, get off my bit. lawn, but <laughs> you can see all the great, but it is, it is one of those things where I'm just used to, there's a certain sort of courtesy that you give, like come and talk to me if there's, if there's a big issue instead of just shooting a text or an email. And I'm, I'm trying to impress that upon certainly my kids, but, um, kind of the folks who will come into the organization. Uh, if we're in a meeting, don't always be dabbling on your phone. Like it's just a certain amount of courtesy when I'm talking to you. Um, the least I can do is give you oh, my attention and my focus. Angry. That makes yeah. me angry. I just yeah. snap it. Yeah. I, think, I think what you're talking about is illustrated so well with that. It's become so socially uh, acceptable to sit at dinner or in a work meeting and I'll see people that do it with me like if you're in one of our classes, I'll say, hey, man, I know we're like, I know we're kind of talking about life and death stuff here that can kill people. But, I, you know, you want to finish that up. And I don't do it <laughs> often. But if somebody keeps doing it, like, what are you doing here? What are you doing? Like, let's get get back into this. Yeah, that's that is one of those things that gets me spun up. I have to admit, that's a bit of a. Bit of a pressure point for me can you make a device since you guys have a bunch of smart people that will just like shut every phone off in the room at the push of like a little button in your pocket you can just reach in and push it and it'll zap all the batteries to zero percent that would be cool i'll buy in wow all right let me let me see that might be our next innovation after that about would be it. cool that would be cool it's the talk <laughs> talking about the like the texting and stuff it's the it's so illustrated on social media or or anywhere online i can just spout my viewpoint and it can be vile and hateful and hurtful and it's not just that there's nobody to look at me and face me but it's just become acceptable to do that because i feel this way like we're not compassionate or caring about other people's feelings there's no empathy like that this guy is a doctor he's got this all this life experience i could just disagree and say you're a quack and write that online and dismiss everything that you've done with your life and that's become kind of the norm for people yeah yeah it's it's, it's crazy i think hiding behind you know your monitor or your computer uh people uh, people are willing to say things they they otherwise wouldn't say and so the civility um of dialogue that i think we're sort of used to is kind of flown out the window and um makes me a little bit sad uh to see that but um, I think like all things, there's going to be a progression and, and people are going to migrate to or away from technologies that are good or bad for them. And, uh, you know, I, I found, uh, for some of these social media platforms and I won't mention uh, specific ones, but I just shut them off from time to time. Cause it's not good. Like I don't, I don't gain much, uh, um, it's not something that's positive or constructive for me. And it's not where, you know, I get my, oh, I'm, I have the same thing. I'll sit there and go, wait a minute, 15 minutes just went by and what did I just do for an hour? <laughs> you know, you just scroll, scrolling through pictures of, Oh, look at that. That dog's got tap dance shoes on, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever the silly thing is. <laughs> yeah. It, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Our time's too valuable to to be better going for a walk with your kids or something like that absolutely yeah so what's next for you guys you you are proliferating this therapy um is it on an upward trend are people more people finding out about it you're still developing data is there new uh, uh testing and equipment uh 
you know, talk about that a little bit. What's the next steps? What's the next phase? Yeah, and, and I think it's all the above. And, and so a lot of our um, time and energy and bandwidth is uh, getting smarter about the algorithms and sort of adding some machine learning components to this so we can really um, understand neural networks and how we are, uh, how we are improving people's uh, function. And I think part of that is, would this translate into um, kind of a smaller device that people don't have to come in uh, to a clinic setting? And so if our goal and our mission is to democratize the accessibility of these types of technologies, trying to help people and, and people who may in some cases be vulnerable, um, it's sometimes very difficult for people to travel to a center. Uh, people sometimes may be intimidated um, to talk to a doctor or bear their soul in a certain way. And so we're trying to develop uh, new products that people could uh, use from the comfort of their home or find some kind of intermediate balance. And so we're working towards um, creating portable uh, equipment. Um, and I think we're, um, we're not too far off from that. I would say um, maybe within a year, uh, we might be able to uh, create something along those lines. Would this be something the patient would self uh, apply or would it be something like maybe a clinic would have that they could travel with or like a, a family doc could have? It, we're still, so we're still sorting through that, whether it would have to be under physician supervision or whether this could be kind of a wellness human performance uh, product offering where people wouldn't have to go through um, the medical system to, to be able to have access to this. And so there's all kinds of regulatory considerations that we're working through. Uh, but ultimately, if uh, we're able to get this to more people and break down some of those barriers, we can serve uh, more of humanity uh, in a meaningful way. And, and that's uh, a lot of what our attention is on right now. Um, so I, I think really proving this out from a scientific realm and we're working uh, again to do more research, but also uh, trying to find ways that we can make this more accessible to everyone. I think it's fascinating. When you guys uh, first hooked up with us, I was like um, doing some reading on it, but just talking to you has shed a lot more uh, on what you guys have done. I think it's fascinating stuff. Um, you know, coming from a background with abuse, uh, and seeing what it does to the, the human animal, so to speak. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I'm interested to, uh, to talk more about it in the future. I'm excited that you guys reached out to us. And I really appreciate not only your service uh, to the Navy and to our country, but you know, what you're doing nowadays, it's, uh, it's fantastic stuff. So people can find you at uh, waveneuro.com, right? Yep. Or brain treatment center, they just punch that into the Google. Yeah, yeah, it, either one of those, and uh, it'll lead them to it'll lead them to our website. Um, and in the show notes, um, you know, you're welcome to put my contact information, and uh, I'll talk to folks who are interested or have questions. Um, yeah, I'm available. We'll, we'll make sure you guys email us that. I really appreciate it. You guys that listened, if uh, stuff that we talked about today struck you or you've got a family member uh, that, that you feel that this could be a helpful treatment for them, check it out. Uh, it's a lot better than uh, doing nothing, and it's a heck of a lot better than a lot of the ways that people tend to medicate themselves to get through the day and get through life. So uh, I would strongly suggest it. Doc, we appreciate your time, your energy, your uh, your service, like I said. You guys listening, be well. Don't be dickheads. Tell somebody you love them. <laughs> Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.